so Lesson 24, Old Testament Prophecy. And uh, we have, I'll just hit the review slide. We've covered most of our review. But uh, we talked about the, in the introduction, we just talked about the basic concepts, what prophecy is all about, and also dispensationalism. Then in the Pentateuch, we begin with man's sin problem, but then how is God going to address it? And it, eventually he has a, sl- a, a solution, which is a man who will come to destroy the serpent, and he, he begins to wi- work through the process in Genesis and in the Pentateuch of working through uh, the nation through whom that man will come. And then we uh, talked about the former prophets, so that's the historical books, and we learn more about that man that he would be a king, that he would be a priest, and he would be the son of David. And now we've been working through the Messianic Psalms, and there's uh, four, I tried to summarize the points. It's not everything that the Messianic Psalms say, but uh, for example, the concept of the anointed, the relationship between Messiah and God, the idea of the king, the relationship between Messiah, Adam, and David as the ultimate king. Uh, the, the Savior, the relationship between Messiah and his people through suffering. And then the victor, the ultimate relationship between Messiah and all creation, including all mankind. Now, all of those ideas are sort of touched on or figured in the Messianic Psalms. Today we're coming to prophecy in the latter prophets. And uh, we're going to be looking at Obadiah. So Today, what we're going to do different is I'm going to have you actually open your Bibles rather than have the passage on the screen because there's just too much text to really look at on the screen and put it on in any comprehensible way. So in the latter prophets, this means the writing prophets, once we hit uh, Isaiah, Isaiah right through the five major prophets, and then we have the minor prophets, Obadiah is is a minor prophet. It's minor because he's shorter, I think, is in, in content. And he's the, he is actually the first writing prophet. The chronological order followed here is approximately that of Unger in his introductory guide to the Old Testament. I was thinking about Obadiah and that I should have <clears throat> uh, put him in the context of which king he was with, but I didn't. I was just thinking about the content. So Obadiah comes about 840 B.C., now, that's about 200 years after David. David was 1040 to about 1000 uh, B.C., as I recall the history. Solomon then is into the 900s. So, about 200 years after David. And so now comes Obadiah. And uh, his name means servant of Jehovah. So, uh, the, you see that Yah ending, I-A-H, that's Jehovah there. That's short for Jehovah. And Obad means servant, all right, servant of Jehovah. So the book starts, or the, it's just one chapter, it starts with an illustration of Edom. And we'll read a few of these verses. So verses 1 through 14. Uh, the vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise and let us go against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. All right, and it carries on in this vein all the way through verse 14. So uh, who is Edom to start with? Esau. All right, so these are the descendants of Esau. They are settled to the east of, uh, of Israel uh, in, the, in the southeast area. If you think about the Dead Sea, and, the, and uh, if you've got a map of Israel in your mind, that part is sort of from the, from the uh, central or southern part of the Dead Sea to the east. That region is where Edom lives. The city of Petra, you may have seen pictures of that. That's in Edom, that's an Edomite city. And, uh, and, you, and what, what kind of character do you see in this, this uh, prophecy, in the, just these two verses we've looked at? What is God saying to Edom? First two verses there. They're despised. What's God, what's God going to do? He's going to bring somebody against them. All right. And so we, we go through and he's prophesying against Edom now here in these, and you can read through. It's all 
uh, verse 6, Oh, how Esau will be ransacked. All right, and it just carries on. Why? Verse 10, because of your violence to your brother Jacob. So this is a judgment on Edom because of their violence towards Jacob, towards Israel. All right? So it's, and this is, uh, this judgment against Edom is, I put in the notes, a prefiguring of worldwide judgment. So uh, it's, it's in a, an extended sense you can think about this this way. It's not saying that's what this, this is what it means, but in a sense, because God is against Edom for its wickedness, it is comparable to God being against the whole world for their wickedness and rebellion against him. All right, so the significant thing about Obadiah is the prophecy about the day of the Lord. And if you go down to verse 15, in my Bible I have a header. It says, the day of the Lord and the future. And so the, this now brings in the day of the Lord. And let's read verse 15. For the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. So now we're going beyond just Edom beyond the dispute that God has with Edom because of their mistreatment of Israel. For the day of the Lord draws near on all the nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. So, a couple of things we need to note. This is the first mention of the day of the Lord in the scriptures. Okay, we've talked about this term many times. Okay, here's the bus coming for Dorothy. So, if our folks can help get her going... And Dorothy, you'll just have to catch this later. <laughs> All right. The, uh, uh, so the, this is the first time that the day of the Lord is mentioned. We've talked about the day of the Lord many, many times over the years. It is a big prophetic term. It refers to the, uh, the Lord settings, setting things right. We've talked about, uh, we talked about justice in our... Um, uh, in our um, message this morning, and the desire for justice that uh, everybody has in the world. And uh, this is the day, God says, justice will come. As you have done, it will be done to you. Okay? Your dealings will return on your own head. This is a day of justice. Uh, there are two aspects to the day of the Lord. One aspect is judgment, the other is blessing. All right, so we're going to find in the Day of the Lord prophecies, and even in this prophecy, this section, we're going to find judgment and blessing. Uh, oh, I, should, I must be clicking these things. All right. Uh, all right, on the Day of the Lord, the Day of the Lord is not the judgment day. It's not the great white throne judgment. It's not the final judgment. It is a day that is going to come on the earth. It's different from the judgment day. It is rather the time that Jehovah reveals himself in majesty and power, overthrowing all evil and establishing his kingdom. Uh, The ideas of retribution and judgment for sin naturally remain a part of the day of the Lord revelation. So look at verse 16. Because you drank on my holy mountain, all the nations will drink continually. They will drink and swallow and become as if they had never existed. So, this is uh, poetic imagery, but the idea is the nations who have opposed Israel, it's like they drank down Israel on his holy mountain, which is Mount Zion. All right, the holy mountain, sometimes the term mountain is a figure for a nation, so they've, they've attacked Israel. All the nations then, he says, will drink continually. They'll drink the cup of God's wrath, and become as if they had never existed. So that's what this poetry is. It's announcing a day of judgment that's going to come against the nations. The time of the day of the Lord extends, this is from Custer's notes, from the beginning of the tribulation to the end of the millennium, at least a thousand and seven years. Now we do not, uh, we do not, we're not, that's just a statement. We're just describing what this term means. It's not proved by anything in these verses. That statement of a thousand and seven years, the, tri- the day of uh, the tribulation and the millennial kingdom, is a, the logical outworking of day of the Lord revelation throughout the scriptures. So it's just put in here to help you understand what it is we're talking about. We're talking about that whole period of time. That is all the day of the Lord. 
Okay. Uh, maybe we should pause. Any questions on that on that concept, on the concept of the day of the Lord? Is it something that I said that perhaps was confusing or not clear? Anybody have a question there? We can keep going. All right. So, the rise of Mount Zion. Je- Jehovah will establish Israel in Mount Zion. We, verse 17 says, But on Mount Zion there will be those who escape, and it will be holy, and the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. All right, so there's this re- revival or renewal of Mount Zion as a holy place. And that's another term for Jerusalem, by the way. Mount Zion is another term for Jerusalem. And um, verses 18 to 20 say, No Edomites will return. Edom will be a possession of Israel, is the summary of these verses. And the house of Jacob will be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, but the house of Esau will be as stubble, and they will set them on fire and consume them, so there will be no survivor of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Then those of the Negev will possess the mountain of Esau, and those of the Shephelah the Philistine plain. Also, possess the territory of Ephraim and the territory of Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead. And the exiles of this host of the sons of Israel who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Sepharad, will possess the cities of the Negev. Now, all of these place names, I think, I don't know all of them, but most of them that I know are in the south region, uh, the Sinai Peninsula, the areas of Edom to their, that are to the east. All of these things, this prophecy is saying, will then become a part of Israel. And uh, the last thing, uh, let's see, we have verse 21. It says, The deliverers will ascend Mount Zion, to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. So the, the King James call, translates, translates this, the saviors will judge Edom from Mount Zion. Now, um, what this implies then is a ruling class of judges implied by this uh, prophecy. And uh, the passage stresses the dominion granted to God's people Israel in the day of the Lord. Now, uh, There's a parallel, or there's a a cross-reference. If you'll look over at Matthew 19 and verse 28. Hold your finger here in Obadiah. And Matthew 19, all right, and verse 28. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And he says um, something that is very remarkable to them. Peter, well, let's look at verse 27. Then Peter said to him, Behold, we have left everything and followed you. What then will there be for us? As only Peter will say, right? They're all thinking this, but Peter's saying it. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So what Jesus is saying, we have here in Obadiah this idea, the deliverers will will ascend Mount Zion, Jerusalem, to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. And I believe that that ties in with what Jesus said in Matthew 19, 28. Who are these saviors going to be? It's going to be the 12 apostles judging, ruling, serving the Lord as his assistants in ruling the kingdom in that age. All right, and so uh, the final point on this is the sovereignty of the Lord in verse 21. The kingdom will be the Lord's. And there we see the capitalized uh, Lord. That means Jehovah. It belongs to Jehovah. And so Obadiah introduces the day of the Lord. It's a day of judgment and it's a day of blessing. It's a day of the restoration of Mount Zion and the expansion of, of uh, the, the land of Israel and uh, a new kingdom that will stand on the earth. And it, it, the prophecy begins, as we said, in this conflict between Edom and Israel. And, and a judgment is pronounced against Edom. Because, and, and prophetically, there, I mean, there's, a, there's an immediate application of this prophecy. Uh, Edom was in the wrong. They shouldn't have been attacking Israel or, or uh, being involved against Israel. But, but God then takes and go, uh, sort of like uh, he kicks it into overdrive when you hit verse 15 and, the, and the, the prophecy goes beyond merely 
this, this sort of minor issue between Israel and Edom. And it becomes a prophecy that has worldwide implications and end of the world implications. Right? Do you see how that's happening in that passage? Any questions on Obadiah? Yes, Marlene. Okay, that's fine. I, it's, well, this prophecy is very general. It's a very uh, specific. It's, it's very specific to Edom and Jacob to start with, but then the extension is that uh, as we look at this, uh, as we go through this last bit, it becomes Mount Zion becomes the center of the world. It's the ruling. You know, it's like the throne of the world. And then, uh, the, and the rest of it then applies in a much broader sense to the whole world. But he's talking in still in fairly general terms. So it's sort of introducing to us the idea of the day of the Lord. Okay, so it, it is. And the other thing that you're dealing with here is you're dealing with uh, Hebrew poetry. So you're, he's saying more than he means. Than he's, you know, the words, if it was just prose, it would be... a interpreted a little bit differently, but because it's poetry, there is, these short phrases stand for a lot more than what uh, is, uh, that, we might, that might seem on the surface. All right? All right, Marilyn. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 Well, we will get there eventually, but these are, but it's all part and parcel. What we're doing right here is this is the this is the very beginning of the prophecy of the day of the Lord. So it's it's couched in fairly vague terms. You can it talks about the rise of Mount Zion. It talks about the putting down, especially of Esau of Edom, but by extension all the nations. You see. So it's so it's sort of like you remember back in Genesis three fifteen where you have the proto evangelium. And it says, the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. Now that's very vague, right? That's very vague. Now as we've gone along, we've realized that seed of the woman means there's a man coming. And, and he keeps, the focus keeps coming about this man. He's going to be a king, he's going to be a prophet, he's going to be a priest. All of that we've learned so far. And now we're bringing in the day of the Lord. This is the day of making everything right, of justice, all right? People have been looking for justice. Well, here it's coming. Except the problem is, if you don't know the Lord, you're not going to like the justice you get. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay, I'm ready to move on to Joel, if you're ready to. All right. So Joel, 800, around 800 B.C., a little bit after Obadiah. His name means Jehovah is God. So the Jehovah part is in the Yo, Yoel, Yoel, El is another is short for Elohim. All right, Jehovah, Jehovah is God. All right, the uh, the main theme of Joel is the day of Jehovah or the day of the Lord. Same thing, okay. But he has an inter- and if you want to look back, okay, Joel is the ne- it's just before okay, Joel, Amos, Obadiah. So it's just a couple books before. Just is it just after Daniel? No, after Hosea. Hosea, Joel, Amos. All right, so. Now, we're not going to read all of Joel. It's three chapters. So we're just going to hit highlights. But the main theme of Jehovah is the day, or of Joel is the day of Jehovah. And there is a, uh, there's a main illustration, the locust plagues. And it starts right at the beginning. So let's look at a few of these verses. Look at verse 4. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust has left, the creeping locust is eaten. What the creeping locust has left, the stripping locust is eaten. And then he goes, Awake, drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you wine drinkers, on account of the sweet wine that is cut off from your mouth. For a nation has invaded my land, mighty and without number. Its teeth are the teeth of a lion. It had the fangs of a lioness. It has made my vine a waste, and my fig tree splinters. It has stripped them bare and cast them away. Their branches have become white. Now, I'm not going to read all of this. But you see this uh, imagery. Now he adds, he, he mixes metaphors. He's, first he's got the locusts, they've chewed everything up, and then he's got the lions. What else has he got in there? Anyway, and he talks about the vine and the fig tree. Those are symbols often in prophecy for Israel. 
Okay, my vine, my fig tree. And there, so, and you'll see this repeated again and again. And uh, uh, there's um, a famous Isaiah chapter 5 talks about the Lord's vineyard and talks about how he has watered the vine and how he's uh, dug around the vine, he's fertilized the vine, and he's looking for grapes, and what does he get? He gets sour grapes. And so, so he's saying, uh, Israel, your judgment is coming. All right? Well, this is part of that same idea. This theme gets repeated in the prophets. But here he uses this uh, idea of insect plagues. And it goes on through, like verse 15, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, it will come as a destruction from the Almighty. So this uh, uh, insect plagues uh, foreshadows the coming judgments of the day of Jehovah. The day of Jehovah is always the judgment aspect of the second coming. Right? Now the whole term, you know, the whole idea, we can call that whole period the tribulation and the millennium as the day of the Lord. But really the emphasis when we talk about the day of Jehovah or the day of the Lord, we're talking about judgment that's coming on the earth. Uh, punishment upon unbelieving Israel and unbelieving Gentiles alike is part of the judgment of this day in the prophets. So that's what we're seeing here in, these, in this language. Now, um, it is described in chapter 2 by awesome language. I've put in my note on the screen, mighty phenomena, the day of the Lord like no other. So chapter 2, verses 1 through 11 Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. There's that symbol, my holy mountain, that's Jerusalem. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, as the dawn is spread over the mountains. So there is a great and mighty people. There has never been anything like it, nor will there be any again after it. To the years of many generations, a fire consumes before them. Behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, but a desolate wilderness behind them. And he goes on and on. There's a whole host of imagery here of this uh, invading army, it looks like. It's a day of darkness and desolation. They're invading armies. Uh, verse 10, Before them the earth quakes, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon grow dark, the stars lose their brightness. So there's celestial and earthly phenomena. And uh, verse 11, the Lord utters his voice before his army. Surely his camp is very great. For uh, strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. And who can endure it? So Jehovah's armies are ready for this terrible day. Well, now he's saying this to Judah. Now the previous prophecy, Obadiah, was a prophecy against Edom. Now he's saying this to Israel. He's saying, there's a day of judgment coming. It's like the locusts. They've wiped out your land. They, uh, and I've heard, read about locust plagues. They'll come in and they'll just strip everything bare. I mean, just strip everything. And uh, apparently there's been some trouble with locusts. Not in, uh, this year in Africa, uh, I've, I've read. And uh, as if uh, 2020 is sort of like the day of the Lord, isn't it? It seems like it's, we're getting a lot of this. But anyway... The, so there's this very dramatic picture. You read these verses and it's, uh, you, you, you feel like you're, if you were to set this to music, you would have the martial drum beat going. You know, uh, or um, if you uh, think of uh, some movie you've seen, I, I've recently been re-watching The Lord of the Rings. I'm not sure why I do this, but I, I do enjoy them. And there's these scenes where you know, the, the, the real evil... Uh, creatures are coming and you hear these drums, boom, boom, boom. Well, that would accompany this passage, all right? It's a, it's a passage of judgment, all right? Very dramatic. Well, what should Israel do? Verse 12, Israel do, should do this. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart and with fasting and weeping and mourning and rend your heart and not your garments now return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abundant, abounding in loving kindness, relenting of evil, and so forth. He calls the people to repentance in the latter part of chapter 2. Okay, verse, right through the verse 17. Let the priests, the Lord's ministers, weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, do not make your inheritance a reproach. 
So there is this opportunity or this call to repentance. Uh, I guess uh, verse 18, he promises deliverance. Okay. Uh, the call to repentance. And there are mighty promises. So verses 18 to 27, he talks about the restoration. There's a deliverance that's promised. Uh, so you know, the Lord will resupply his people. Verse 19, the Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I'm going to send you grain, new wine, and oil. The, the locusts have stripped your fields. I'm going to send you grain, and you will be so fully satisfied with all of them. Uh, verse 20, he says, I will remove the northern army uh, from, uh, from you. And then uh, the Lord calls the people in the land to rejoice, verses 21 to 24. And I'm not sure what letter D is supposed to mean. Anyway, uh, and the Lord promises to restore in verse 25 what the locusts ate. I will make up for you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the creeping locust, the stripping locust, and the gnawing locust, my great army which I sent among you. If you think back, that's what he starts with in chapter 1, verse 4. What the gnawing locust has left, the swarming locust has eaten, and so forth. He goes through all of that. And... Uh, the uh, King James translates it this way, the locust, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm. These are all various stages of the locust. Uh, the palmer worm is the gnawing or wingless locust out of the egg at the beginning of spring. The, the word locust, uh, the swarming locust comes at the end of spring. The canker worm or creeping or licking locust is a small leaping form. And the caterpillar, a stripping locust, the mature locust, three inches long, it's the most destructive so all of these are described in these verses. All right, but the Lord promises to restore what the locusts ate. And so there's this restoration. If they will repent, there's restoration. And then we come to verses 28 and 29, which is the one that's quoted uh, in the book of Acts. It will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Now, this is quoted by um, Peter in Acts chapter 2. He's citing the day of Pentecost as, as a fulfillment of these verses, the coming of the Spirit. All right? Um, the... Uh, uh, that means that the fulfillment begins, but the fulfillment isn't complete at Pentecost because in verse 30 he says, I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So the, the Pentecost is like a, a, a first installment of this. But he then lapses into that day of the Lord language. He's talking about those great phenomena that will be seen, the changes in the heavens, that parallels with what we see in Revelation, what we see in other prophets about the day of the Lord. So all of these wonders that we see there in those verses are things that, uh, that are part of, of all this day of the Lord prophecy. This part of the prophecy was not fulfilled at Pentecost. So the greater fulfillment of the last day will see the Spirit poured out on all flesh. It implies uh, universal conversion. This is not today. There's many people who resist today. But this is the day at the beginning of the millennial kingdom. So we have other prophecies that talk about when the Lord returns. We've had the end of the tribulation. We have the Lord coming back to, to finalize the defeat of Antichrist and Satan. And it says that every, uh, or the, uh, every eye of Israel, says, they will look on him whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as for an only son. It says that in Zechariah. And uh, we've talked about that before. So that when the son returns, those who are alive going into the millennial kingdom will be converted. There won't be a one of them who don't believe in the Lord. Uh, but uh, it says, none who are rebellious. Let me just look at verse... 31, uh, verse 32, it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be those who escape, as the Lord said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. So there will be none who are rebellious who will enter into uh, this kingdom. 
uh, at its inauguration. But they will have, I note in there, they, uh, they will have unregenerated sons and daughters who will be born to them who will need to be converted during the millennial kingdom. Uh, and some of them uh, apparently will not be because they will rise in rebellion at the end of the thousand years, even in a perfect environment. Uh, all right. Uh, we've talked about the signs and wonders, verses 30 to 32. Uh, let's see here. Then the final battle, verse, chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. Compare this with Revelation 14. I'm not going to read all of these, I don't think, for in sake of time. But, for example, verse. let's look down to verse 12 of chapter 3. Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. And then verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And then verse 15, for the sun and moon grow dark and the stars lose their brightness. We see that repeated again. And so I, want, I should probably look over at Revelation 14 for a little bit of this, but this is in preparation for the battle of Armageddon that we see revealed in Revelation. So let's look at... Uh, 14, and he starts in verse 14. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head, and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also had a sharp sickle. And then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. For the wine press, and the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the wine press up to the horses' bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Now that's very graphic. I don't know if you know, notice that. Okay, so this is judgment. And this, this, uh, the valley of Jehoshaphat that we see in Joel is, and the, connected with the day of the Lord, this is the nations gathered against Israel in the last days who will be brought to judgment by God. And we tie that in with this passage in Revelation and we see the final uh, judging of mankind. All right. Joel, in his conclusion, turns to the, the blessing aspect. Look at verse seven, uh, Looking back in Joel, chapter 3, verse 17. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, so Jerusalem will be holy and strangers will pass through it no more. In that day, the mountains will drop with sweet wine, the hills will flow with milk, all the brooks of Judah will flow with water, and a spring will go out from the house of uh, Jacob uh, to... Uh, sorry, I looked... Where am I? House of the Lord. Sorry, I was looking at my screen and do it, trying to read at the same time. House of the Lord to, the water, uh, uh, to water the valley of Shittim. Egypt will become a waste and Edom will become a desolate wilderness because of the violence done to the sons of Judah in whose land they have shed innocent blood. But Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem for all generations. I will avenge their blood, which I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. So he concludes with this blessing aspect. The Lord will be in Mount Zion. Jerusalem will be cleansed and be holy. Judah will experience kingdom blessings. A fountain will flow from the house of the Lord. So that's the message of Joel. Now we need to talk about some of the specific direct applications. When he's talking about the army that's going to come in and, and, uh, and ravage Judah, uh, the uh, prophecy is really looking forward to Babylon. Babylon is going to come, destroy everything, take people away. And in fact, since that day, Judah, Israel has not existed as a sovereign nation, uh, except for two instances. One was the, the uh, Maccabees, before Christ, 
had a brief period of an independent kingdom, and then they were overtaken by the Romans. And then after that was, uh, is now, in 1948. And so all, Judah's been under this uh, uh, judgment all these years. And even, as we've said, the re- restoral of is- Israel, it is, it is uh, significant of something, but it isn't the same as the Lord being in Mount Zion. It isn't the same as Israel now blossoming like a rose, not in the sense that it will in the millennial kingdom. But there is all, these, all this language, some of it is a bit vague, but it is referring to these historical events. I think that the armies coming in, stripping Judah bare, and all of that definitely refers to Babylon. There's no doubt about that in my mind. The, uh, but the, com- the, restoration, the restoration hasn't happened like it's been described here. Judah hasn't repented. Uh, they haven't come back yet, but the prophecies are still there. We believe God uttered them, and so we trust that this indeed is what will happen. That's Joel. All right, so we've run through Joel real fast. How? Any comments? Marilyn? Yeah. 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 Yes, well, in the millennial or in the tribulation and in the millennial era, that may, if, if, there is an indication that sign gifts will be uh, uh, active. Okay, they are, as we understand it, they're, the, they're not active now. They were part of the age of the, pro, the apostles or the time of the apostles, from what the scriptures say and what history has shown us. They're not active now, but there will be a time when they will be active again. Yes, Maureen. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's what I would say. Yeah, so Maureen's talking about the idea of prophecy having a near fulfillment and then having an ultimate fulfillment, and I think that's what we're seeing here. So Pentecost becomes a near fulfillment of this, and it's, but it's not the whole thing. It's not as, as it will be entirely fulfilled in a later period. Okay? And go ahead. Sorry, but that, so then like, like when the 144,000 are active on the earth, is it there? Do you have it there? I believe so, yes. The, the 144,000 who are not Jehovah's Witnesses will be active in the last days, and they will be given some of these gifts as signs of their message from God, I believe. Okay. Yes, Andrew. Do you have any idea how many prophets are from the Old Testament? How many prophets? How many prophets? Yeah. Well, the writing prophets, we have about um, 15 or so of them. Or, well, uh, 12, maybe 16. Yeah. Um, but there are more speaking prophets. I don't know how many there of those there were. But as far as just those who wrote uh, down prophecies, we have 15. Okay. All right. Okay, so we covered uh, Joel. I just have a few words about Jonah. Jonah's mean, word, uh, name means dove, which seems, well, he did try to fly away, so maybe that's why it comes to that. Okay, so Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. Is he next after Obadiah? There he is. All right, now I'm not going to go into great detail with Jonah. You know this, you're quite familiar with the story of Jonah. So there's, the Lord calls him to go to preach in Nineveh. He says, no way, they're so wicked, I'm not going there. He hires the ship to go to Tarshish, which is Spain, and he uh, gets into a violent storm. And, uh, and he tells them, throw me overboard because I'm the problem. So they throw him overboard. The end of chapter 1, a great fish comes and swallows Jonah up. We always talk about Jonah the whale, but it doesn't say whale. It says great fish. We don't know what it was. Okay, and uh, the and then we have this prayer of Jonah in chapter two, where he's in the belly of the fish, or at least he's recalling his experience. He's not a happy camper, no doubt, but he is asking God for his deliverance. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. That's the end of chapter two. 
Chapter 3, he says, all right, I better go to, Joan, uh, to Nineveh. And so he goes to Nineveh. I don't know what kind of shape he was in, uh, but whatever he did, his preaching caused them to repent. And so then he is unhappy about this. He says, Lord, I knew you'd do this. You'd delay your judgment because I knew they'd repent, and I just said, why went I away in the first place? And so there's Jonah pouting on the hill outside of Nineveh, because, uh, mad because the Lord hasn't judged them. So you know the story. All right, so there's three basic points about Jonah. First of all, it's a prophetic sign of Christ. Okay, what happened to Jonah? So Matthew 12, uh, Jesus says, As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. So, there, so his experience is a prophetic sign of Christ. Okay, and that's validated by the Lord Jesus himself. And then it is a type of the resurrection of Christ, because as... I mean, in a sense, the Lord was vomited out of the earth. We don't want to use those terms, but that's the resurrection, right? That's a picture, a picture of the resurrection. And then the third thing is he prepared Israel for the idea that Gentiles were also in God's kingdom. So Jonah's ministry prepared Israel for this idea uh, that in God's time they would become into the kingdom by salvation. So this is, he was... Uh, like many Jews, he didn't have a lot of use for uh, Gentiles. And um, uh, he uh, was very antagonistic towards them, but the Lord sent him to preach to them, and he, uh, there was a great revival. And in fact, the Assyrian nation, Nineveh, its capital, lasted an extra hundred years after this time before it was finally overthrown. The Assyrians were very wicked people. But this generation of Assyrians turned to the Lord. And I, as I read the Bible, I believe that some of those people will be in heaven someday and we will meet them and find out what it was like to hear this strange guy uh, come out of the belly of the fish and preach to them. So, anyhow. So that's Jonah. Uh, we're not going to say a lot about him. Any comments about Jonah? Marilyn. Yes. Well, these are all words that he's using. There, It's imagery. And he's talking about, he feels like he's dead in the, in the ship's belly. And I, you'd think. I mean, I don't know how he survived. The Lord is totally capable. He could have died. I mean, it could have been. And God just brought him and he revived him. I don't know what happened. So it's all poetic language. But he's, he is somehow aware of how desperate his situation is in the belly of this fish. And he is, uh, he is describing it in very vivid language. And the word corruption is yeah, but if you're in the belly of a fish, you're going to be amongst a bunch of stuff that's pretty corrupt. <laughs> right? If this is a really good um, picture of Christ's resurrection, would be better if Jonah actually did die? Because then well, yeah. You know, yeah, well, it's not, uh, we don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to speculate on what actually happened but we do, uh, about the, uh, those details. But the, what we have is what we have, and that's all we can say. Marilyn, uh, Marlene, you want to ask something? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, I have heard that too, but I had I didn't go and research this one on this occasion to see whether, you know, somebody there are verifiable. Like often, there are stories that are told by preachers. I call them preacher stories. They're not exactly true, but they're told because somebody heard it and it sounded neat. And some guys don't check it out. So I'm not a hundred percent sure if those are true. I have heard those kind of stories be- myself. But, you know, I would want to make sure. I would want to make sure to be, that it was true. Because... Oh, certainly. All kinds of people worship. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, lots of people have... Everything under the sun has been worshipped. Okay? So, anyway. But this is a great deliverance. And here is a picture of uh, the... Uh, 
you know, ultimately there's a connection to Christ's ministry and to his, to his, uh, to the worldwide evangelization of Gentiles, which we're very grateful for. All right. Any last questions or comments? Okay. Well, let's pray and we'll close. Our Father, thank you for this time today. We've rushed through three prophets. Lord, I pray that as we gain our understanding here, it will help us to understand the breadth and the scope of uh, Old Testament prophecy. Uh, We're not looking to be experts, but we're just trying to survey what the material says so that we understand what the prophets were talking about. And uh, help us to be clear and help us to say just what the scriptures say and not much more than that. In Jesus' name. Mm